Black Panther Wakanda Forever's ending and mid credit scene explained. Welcome back, you Marvel maniacs! Black Panther Wakanda Forever is finally in theaters everywhere to close the curtains on Marvel's Phase 4. The film is a powerful meditation on grief, tradition, and vengeance that serves as both a fitting farewell for the late, great Chadwick Boseman, and sets up exciting possibilities for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And while we provided a spoiler-free review roundup earlier this week, now we're heading firmly into spoiler territory for our breakdown and analysis of the film's ending and mid credit scene. Now, obviously, this video is intended for you to watch after you've had the chance to see Black Panther Wakanda Forever. And if you prefer to read all about it, Michael Walsh has you covered over on Nerdist.com. But if you haven't seen the movie yet and you're worried about spoilers, leave now before it's too late. It's now or never. Yes, sir. Hi. <sighs> no, seriously, spoilers ahead. This is your final warning. <laughs> Okay, let's get into it, shall we? Now, amid its headier themes, Black Panther Wakanda Forever is concerned with a few primary questions. Number one, who will become the next Black Panther, the traditional protector of Wakanda? And number two, who will win the battle between Wakanda and Talo Khan? And we do have answers to those questions by the film's end. Shuri is now firmly the Black Panther, having successfully synthesized the heart-shaped herb, and Wakanda is on its way to rebuilding. And although Shuri's quest for vengeance ended in an uneasy armistice with Namor and Talo Khan, Wakanda suffered far greater casualties and structural damage than they did. It's not quite a Pyrrhic victory, but it illustrates the cost of ego-driven conflict when the real enemy are the world powers hellbent on strip-mining Wakanda and Talo Khan for their natural resources like Vibranium. While Shuri replanted a grove of the heart-shaped herb to ensure that future generations can have a Black Panther to protect Wakanda, it's unclear if she wants anything to do with the actual governance of this nation. When the different tribes of Wakanda gather at the Warrior Falls, Shuri sends an envoy in her stead. Umbaku, the leader of the Jabari, who proved himself to be a thoughtful counsel and an adept leader during Crisis. It seems as though Umbaku, rather than Shuri, will be the one to lead the Wakandan people moving forward, at least at home. So, what will Shuri actually be doing? Well, whatever she can to protect Wakanda through her technological innovations, as well as through being the Black Panther. As T'Challa learned firsthand, trying to rule a sovereign nation while fighting alongside Earth's mightiest heroes, it's a pretty difficult balancing act to pull off. As for Riri Williams, she returns to her studies at MIT, but she'll have to leave her advanced Ironheart suit behind. She can try to rebuild her prototype, but realistically, she'll probably try to rebuild one like she wore back in Wakanda. Now, the events of Ironheart will take place directly after Wakanda Forever, and they'll potentially involve Mephisto, too. So maybe she'll make a deal with the devil to get her next suit of armor, or go on one last ride with her dad in the car that Shuri painstakingly rebuilt. As for Namor, he returns with his armies and war whales to Talo Khan to lick his wounds, add some sweet new murals to his private room, and try to calm Namora's fears about him being a feckless ruler. Now, his reasoning for yielding, apart from not wanting to die, was that Wakanda promised to shield them from the rest of the world. And we saw that world powers like France have zero qualms about sending in strike teams to try and illegally seize Wakandan vibranium. Namor believes that Wakanda will continue to attract the world's attention, and they'll need Talo Khan's help one day instead. And you'd better believe he's going to leverage that to Talo Khan's advantage when that day finally comes. Now, in the comics, after Namor flooded much of Wakanda with a tidal wave, Shuri led an attack on Atlantis that devastated its population. Eventually, Namor took his revenge of sorts by invading Wakanda with the shadowy Cabal. They were a group of ne'er-do-wells who were prepared to destroy other realities to stop incursion events. And while Wakanda definitely took the worst of it in this film, we could potentially see similar events to that play out in the future as we head towards Secret Wars in Phase 6. And folks, if nothing else, we finally got to hear Namor utter his comic book catchphrase, Imperious Rex, which is probably his version of For Empire and King. Like everything he does, it's pretty arrogant and self-aggrandizing. Or maybe, as Namor revealed in 2018's Thor number 1, it means I'm going to feed your sorry Asgardian hide to the biggest sharks I can find. Moving on, Okoye manages to spring Everett Ross from federal custody wearing her Midnight Angel armor. And with Val in control of the CIA and both Wakanda and Talo Khan on her radar, they'll definitely need her ex's expertise to help navigate the inevitable threats and thunderbolts she'll hurl their way in the future. 
And also, if you look closely during that sequence, the license plate on that van reads CB112976, and that stands for Chadwick Boseman and his birthday of November 29th, 1976. Rest in peace. And last but not least, we find out the real reason that Shuri was not able to make an appearance at Warrior Falls. She was busy paying a visit to Nakia in Haiti, where she was finally able to burn her funeral garb and accept T'Challa's passing. It's a powerful way to end this story, with Shuri able to finally let go and burn a symbol of that grief that was eating away at her from the inside out. The mid credit scene picks up moments later as Nakia introduces Shuri to the nephew she never knew she had. As it turns out, Nakia and T'Challa had a son, but they both felt it was best to raise him away from the stress and responsibility of Wakanda. It seems like apart from Queen Ramonda, no one knew that he even existed. The boy is known as Toussaint here in Haiti, but his birth name honors his father, T'Challa. The name Toussaint is one with a rich history in Haiti as well. One of the country's greatest heroes is Francois-Dominique Toussaint Louverture, a man who was born into slavery and went on to lead the Haitian Revolution. Although he died a year before Haiti gained its independence, he's widely regarded as the father of Haiti and is a national hero. As for the name Toussaint itself, in French it translates roughly to All Souls, and the Haitian people celebrate All Souls Day each year on November 1st and 2nd. It's a day of remembrance for people to visit cemeteries and bring their departed loved ones offerings of food, rum, and candles. And it seems like a fitting name for Wakandan royalty as well, especially given Wakanda's beliefs about the afterlife, the ancestral plane, and the idea that their ancestors are never truly gone. Or as Michael Walsh puts it on Nerdist.com, T'Challa is a living reminder of his father's own legacy. But beyond the potent symbolism of this scene, we now have to ask the deeply nerdy, comic-centric question of whether or not young T'Challa shares his father's powers. T'Challa did have a son named Azari in the comics at one point, but it was with Storm from the X-Men rather than Nakia. Azari was first introduced in the next Avengers Heroes of Tomorrow animated movie and later in 2010's Avengers No. 1. He inherited the powers of the heart-shaped herb from his father and fought alongside the sons and daughters of other Avengers in a nightmarish alternate reality ruled over by Ultron. Now, this movie established that Namor inherited his powers genetically from his mother, who ingested a special plant that turned the Mayan people into the sea-dwelling Talokani. And since Shuri was able to synthesize the heart-shaped herb using fibers from Namor's mother's bracelet, one could assume that the powers of the herb also might be able to pass genetically as well. So would that make T'Challa a mutant like Namor? Well, it's unclear. But if all else fails, young T'Challa can one day take some of that new heart-shaped herb that Shuri planted. As for what we can expect from young T'Challa in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, maybe one day he could join the Young Avengers team that it seems like Marvel is building towards in Phase 5 or 6. Or he could play a larger role in the eventual Black Panther 3. For now, though, he is a potent symbol of the fact that life moves on and we carry the memory of our ancestors with us into the future through family and lived experience. Anyway, folks, there you have it. That's everything you need to know about Black Panther Wakanda Forever's ending and mid credit scene. We'll have plenty of other breakdowns, analysis, and theories for you in the days ahead on Nerdist, but for now, tell us, what did you think of this movie? What do you think it means for the MCU's Phase 5? Let us know in the comments below, and for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com.